What mercy was revealed What selflessness and peace By fate was surely sealed Until He rescued me His pardon for my sin His bounty for my need From slavery and shame I am redeemed. Sing that one more time. What mercy was revealed. What mercy was revealed. What selflessness and peace. My fate was surely sealed. Until he rescued me. His pardon for my sin. His bounty for my need. From slavery and shame. I am redeemed, and heaven can't contain the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ, the Saving One. His love has made a way, the grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the Fear can hold me down, darkness steal my joy, for blood has been poured out, the enemy destroyed, death could not hold him down, the cross was not enough to steal away his love for me is God, and heaven can contain. Christ the saving one his love has made a way the grave is overcome Jesus is the Christ the saving one one more time no fear can hold me down no darkness steal my joy for blood has been could not hold him down. The cross was not enough to steal away his love for he is God. And heaven can't contain the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way. The great
say this. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let's continue singing.
John 3, 17 to 20 says this, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. Let us read this prayer of confession together. Lord, we confess our sins to you. We have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Forgive our rebellion and unwillingness to follow in your righteousness. Do not turn your face from us but look upon us kindly because of your Son, Jesus Christ, who saved us from our sins. Amen. And our assurance of pardon comes from Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 5, which says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved.
you alone can lift us from the grave. like to invite up Pastor Chris for the offering and pastoral prayer. Now, because of the pandemic, we are not able to pass the plate uh, during offertory, but the plate is at the back. You now, if you're visiting with us, uh, don't feel obligated to give anything. Let's uh, consider that this service is a gift to you. Now, as we celebrate and commemorate the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, you know, the crowd cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word Hosanna means, Lord, save us. And there were three groups of people that were in that crowd. Of course, there was the donkey and the colt who were tied down to the post. And Jesus came to set them free from whatever was tying them. So those of us who know somebody who is tied down to addictions, tied down to challenges, let's remember them in prayer as we do the, offering, the, the pastoral prayer. The second group of people were the crowd. They were broadly supportive, but easily swayed. And there are people in our life who are broadly supportive to Christian, Christianity and Christian values, but they are easily swayed. And the third group of people are the disciples who obeyed Jesus in sending, uh, in going and delivering the donkey that was tied down and worshiped Jesus by setting an example, by putting what they had on the donkey, on the uh, road so that the donkey, Jesus could be seated on the donkey and the donkey would ride. So let's just remember these three groups of people that we know and bring them to the throne of grace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given to us to come into your presence. And as we celebrate, our thoughts and our mind go, goes back to 2,000 years ago with this huge crowd that was excited to receive you, but they were easily swayed. And we pray for those in our community, those in our sphere of influence, and those that we are connected with that are spineless, easily swayed that you would bring them into your fold and that you would establish them in your kingdom. And we pray for those who are tied down and pegged down, unable to just be experiencing and enjoying the freedom that you give to us. So I pray, dear Father, that you would send your disciples to set them free. And we pray for those of your servants and disciples and all of us here, that you would give us that direction to play the role that you have for us in setting people free. And at this time, I also pray for Medad and Nina and Amir. Lord, it seems like they're physically not bound down, but they're uh, shut down from enjoying the freedom that you have won for them. So we pray that you would go before us, help us to finish the application quickly, and may this application find favor in the eyes of the officials. Thank you for Rebecca and Mosley who are helping us in this process and the national office. So we just ask you to go before us. Lord, we thank you for the unit leadership who are visiting us today, for the passion and the burden that they have for our university students on main campus, that they would have a community through which they would be encouraged as they go through this new phase in their life 
of transitioning from high school to university with all of the challenges and the opportunities that we have. We pray for an anointing on the unit leadership that you would give to them the strength and grace. And we thank you for the way that you have helped Arlene and Paul and Lou through, the, through their sicknesses. We pray that your presence would be with them. And we also continue to lift up Pat and uh, lift up uh, Miriam before you that you would be strengthening them in their physical weakness. I also pray for Ron and Anne as Ron has uh, lost his sister-in-law, his brother's wife. I pray that uh, during this time of their loss that you'll be close to them. I particularly pray for the children who have become fatherless and motherless, dear Father. And we remember the promise that you have in your word that you are the God of the fatherless, that you in unawares would just show up in their lives, in the lives of the children, the daughter and the son and the grandchildren, that they would know Jesus, whom their father loved and their grandfather served. I pray, dear Father, this morning as we come into your presence, that your word would be speaking to us and meeting us in our point of need. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Today's scripture reading comes from Psalm 118, 19 to 29. It says, Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifices with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Today we will have Pastor Aaron sharing with us from this message. Thank you, John. Um, so as we are gathered here, I'm uh, really surprised, in a way, to see the palm branches. I d uh, didn't know that that was going to be part of the service, and so thank you for whoever organized it. Um, and today is a day of celebration because, as uh, we have been saying, today is Palm Sunday, which marks the beginning of Passion Week. Uh, and so just as a reminder for us, so Palm Sunday, Jesus is arriving in Jerusalem during the Passover time. And Jerusalem, during this season, would have been busy with activity. Um, and in fact, during Passover, the population within Jerusalem could swell to even three times its normal size. And traditionally, uh, the uh, Palm Sunday is referred to, as uh, Billy Pastor Chris has said, the triumphal entry, where Jesus arrives uh, with the crowds lining the streets and waving the palm branches and saying uh, from Matthew's account, chapter 29, verse 9, uh, 21 verse 9, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, the importance of what is going on here um, is evident to us, uh, if, no if nothing more than the fact that all four of the Gospels recorded this triumphal entry. But then, you know, though we are here to celebrate, and it is a, indeed a joyous occasion, we must also recognize that, you know, sometimes, um, despite the celebration and, and the positivity, that we have to admit that we're not in a mood to celebrate. That what we feel today, right now, is not very happy. And if you've lived long enough, I'm sure you would come to realize that though those happy moments are great and we should treasure them, but yet it always seems like with all the happy moments that they never last too long and we are always brought back down to earth. Because the reality is, and you know, this is evidence even just in the prayer, the pastoral prayer that Pastor Chris offered for, um, for all those who are in distress, in despair, that we live in a world 
filled with despair. And aside from just our own prayer requests here, we only have to look so far as what's going on overseas in Ukraine to understand that. The hopelessness, the suffering of the people there. And while we are fortunate that here in North America we are not suffering like them due to the consequences of war, yet we know right, that we experience pain. It's still there. The despair, the suffering is still there. On Friday night, we had uh, our uh, mental health committee put on a mental health workshop, and our speaker um, stated this during the workshop, that human suffering is universal, that you can talk to anybody and if you talk to them about suffering, you know, everyone gets what that is. And some, you know, some, there will be all these different kinds of things that would drive us to despair, to separation, to a loss of hope. For some, it can be financial loss. Some, it could be marriage problems. Some can be physical illness, whether to themselves or to a loved one. Some, again, mental health challenges, which is huge given, again, we are still in the COVID pandemic. Low self-esteem, depression. There are countless things that would bring us to distress and despair when all seems lost. And I wanna ask you this morning, you know, if you are in that situation or even if you can recollect when you were, right, what do you do when you are in despair? Who or what do you turn to when all hope seems lost and all life seems pointless? What happens? For some people, they do nothing and they just try to bear through what they experience. Others will try to cope. Um, ways of escaping, ways of numbing the pain, alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever that may be. And others still sink deeper and deeper into that pit of despair and some ultimately give up finding no hope and seeing no point to keep fighting. Right? The truth is, and especially in the age of uh, you know, social media today, that behind the external appearances that what we put off and give off, um, even though we sometimes may put on a brave face towards others, right, many are in fact struggling. Many are sad. Many live in despair, and as we come together and celebrate uh, this joyous occasion of Palm Sunday, you know, yes, externally we may be smiling, but internally we are hurting and in pain. But what I want to share with you this morning um, from our psalm is that um, through Jesus, this psalm describes to us, you know, this issue exactly being addressed by him. And uh, I want to point you to uh, here. So uh, what I want to cover with you, and we'll bring this uh, back to this at the end, is that as we look into our passage here today, that in Jesus, God provides victory over your despair. And as we look into Psalm 118, um, it's a rather long psalm, um, and so we're not looking at the entire psalm, but specifically we'll concentrate on uh, the latter half, verses 19 to 29. And so if, if you have a Bible or your phone and you want to follow along, I'll make references uh, to various places within Psalm 118. Um, but I want to encourage you as we delve into this, that just as the psalmist experienced that we will look at, deliverance from our despair is found in God. And we'll tie this in to Palm Sunday and to what Jesus was doing as he entered and the crowds were shouting Hosanna and we'll connect and we'll see um, these themes in Psalm 118 being connected to who Jesus was. But first of all, I just want to share with you a couple of things to know um, from Psalm 18. And so first of all, um, it is a messianic psalm. And so what that means is um, that uh, uh, Psalm 118, along with the other messianic psalms, is a psalm that helps us to interpret Jesus' death and resurrection and also to understand the mission that he sends his disciples on. And so you see this long passage here, Luke chapter 24. I won't read it to you, um, but Jesus states that the psalms is one of the writings written that has things written about him. And what's written, as it says, verse 46, 
that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. And so we see here Jesus himself has said that the Psalms were written about him and 118 is one of those Psalms. It's also in uh, what's referred to as an Egyptian halal. And so halal is the Hebrew word for praise. And with reference and allusions, it's Egyptian because it references and alludes to uh, God's deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. And that will be one of the key themes that we focus on today, deliverance by God. And 118 in particular had an important role during Passover. In fact, Jesus would have sung this psalm along with his disciples in the upper room after their Passover meal. And so Matthew and Mark both referenced that after they had the Passover supper that they sung a hymn. And so it's said that uh, 118, Psalm 118, would have been one of those hymns that they would have sung. Psalm 118 is also meant for uh, antiphonal use, so meaning it's responsive. And so in the English translation, we don't necessarily uh, see that pop out to us. But what's going on here is there's actually a variety of voices that are going back and forth. And so we have the main speaker, the psalmist, so to speak, um, who, uh, who um, declares the work that God has done in delivering him. And then we see the community, the assembly, respond to that. Now, the author, the uh, psalmist, is in fact unknown, but um, some argue that it is in fact King David, and there is evidence, uh, I won't get into that, but regardless of um, the, who the author, if it's King David or not, what we see if we read Psalm 118 is the man speaking is a man of great power in Israel. He talks of you know, the nations overwhelming him. Right? And for our interpretive purposes today, um, I'll kind of go back and forth referring to the, the author as the psalmist or sometimes as the king, right? Um, but uh, I just want to share with you a very basic outline. So it's, it's actually a very simple psalm, even though it's quite long. So verses 1 to 4 starts with an opening call to give thanks. That's followed by verses 5 to 18, where the psalmist, the king, gives a personal testament to his rescue from a vicious attack from his enemies. And then our section, verses 19 to the end, is really a script for a thanksgiving liturgy, a processional that takes place where the community joins in with praising God for what he has done for this psalmist. And John, I believe, in one of his past sermons mentioned that we also see an inclusio in this uh, psalm and what that is. So it's a repetition, a repetition at the beginning and at the end of a section that form bookends. And why that matters is because it tells the reader that what's in the middle uh, is the support or explanation for what those bookends say. And so for us, we look at verse one, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And so the main idea that we get that everything in between goes to expand upon and explain is this praise and thanksgiving to God for his goodness and his steadfast love. And in fact, like I mentioned, um, verse five can summarize for us kind of the gist of what the author shares here in Psalm 118, out of my distress, I called on the Lord, the Lord answered me, and he set me free. And the focus here, again, is on praising God, his steadfast love, his goodness, because of his deliverance for that psalmist out of distress. So that's the basic gist of what's going on here for, uh, in Psalm 118. And like we said, um, it's used in the gospel accounts, and its use then indicates for us um, a connection between what's written here and the person and the work of Jesus. It can give us um, some insight into, again, Jesus' death and his resurrection. And so what does Psalm 118 tell us about Jesus? Well, uh, again, if we keep in mind the theme, then ultimately... What Psalm 118 indicates to us, alluding to, uh, to Jesus, is that Jesus is, in fact, the ultimate display of God's goodness and steadfast love toward his people. 
And I'll expand on that a little bit. But as we begin our passage this morning, uh, at verse 19 and 20, it might seem a little bit odd um, to, to see this. But again, what's happening here in these verses is a transition where the uh, psalmist has shared his experience. And now the assembly at large responds to what the psalmist has shared. And so this is a uh, litur liturgical procession that goes through the gates um, uh, of the temple. And the king, the psalmist, having uh, recited his story of distress and then how God answered his, uh, his prayer, his cry for help, um, he is in front of the gates of the temple. And now verse 19, he calls upon the gatekeepers to open to me the gates of righteousness in order for this processional to continue so that he can then go to the altar and give thanks to the Lord. And verse 20 uh, can be best understood then as a response from the gatekeepers to this request that the king, the psalmist, makes. And after this, is what I, uh, and what follows, is where I want to spend the remainder of our time to th this morning to share with you three things uh, from these verses of what Psalm 118 tells us about Jesus. And so the first thing is this, number one. What does Psalm 118 tell us about Jesus? Number one, in Jesus, you find God's answer to the defeat and the despair that you face. And I'll point back to verse 5, the uh, gist of what's going on in Psalm 118. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Now that word distress, I'm sure, again, it's universal. We can all relate to it. We have an idea of what distress may be, although it may uh, differ in terms of you know, severity and whatnot. But here, when the psalmist writes distress, it's a condition of having um, great trouble, great hardship. It's, uh, the sense really is to be constricted. It's to be cramped up or locked up. Literally, the word says it's in a tight place. So in other words, there was pressure from all sides. And again, I'm sure we can relate to that to some degree. And what caused this stress? Well, if we uh, just look at verses 10 to 13, we can see we hear, uh, here we have essentially a condensed report of the psalmist's experience. He looks back to his time of need. And so then it specifies the nature of the distress that he mentions in verse 5. And so I just want to quickly point, note the repetition surrounded me, verses 10 to 12. An emphasis that on the one hand, there was no escape from his enemy, from what was distressing him. He was surrounded, locked in. But then on the other hand then, it also emphasizes being surrounded then, the magnitude of God's intervention in relieving him of that situation. And again, what I want to just fo focus on and point out that the, it was a bad situation. The distress, it was, you know, great distress. In fact, even hopeless. But yet, even in that distress, where we ourselves from time to time find ourselves to experience and to feel, the psalmist states, verse 21, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. And I just want to emphasize, as you see here bolded, you have answered me. And this is stated in verse 5 and repeated here in verse 21, the same thing. The psalmist, in his distress, cries out, calls out to God, and he answers him. In beginning uh, in verse 22, after the statement is made, uh, we can note a switch in, uh, in, in, in person from first person singular, so I, um, in verse 21, to first person plural, we, in uh, 20, verses 23 to 27. So that indicates that we're at a point here where the community, the assembly, joins in the thanksgiving that was being made to God. And here, in verses uh, 22 to 24, the assembly in fact, interprets the king's distress and suffering. So they just heard the testimony the, the, the psalmist gives, and they interpret what was said. But they interpret it from a little bit of a different perspective. And so whereas the psalmist himself, in verse 18, 
identifies his distress as the result of the Lord's severe discipline upon himself. But the community says something different in what they say, verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, this was a very common image um, in uh, the Old Testament. So whenever builders constructed a stone building, uh, they would usually have to discard some of the stones because they didn't fit uh, properly. So the king felt that way, that he was discarded like one of these stones. However, and this was God's miraculous work, right? God restored him to usefulness. And not just restored him, but then give, gave him a position of prominence in his work. As it says, he became the cornerstone. And the cornerstone of a large building was the largest and most important stone in the foundation. And so from becoming a stone that didn't fit, that was rejected, became the foundation upon all, which all other of the stones were laid upon. So what does that mean? Well, the entire assembly then had a certain way to view what happened to the king. And that view that of the king's experience was of a dramatic reversal. That the king went from being scornfully rejected by the world powers, the nations, but then through God's deliverance, was raised to a prominent and very strategic position in God's kingdom, in his rule over the world. And the community then affirms this miraculous change, this reversal in the psalmist's circumstances, and affirms, verse 23, that it was all God, that it was his miraculous work. And then in recognizing that it was God, they resolve then together, not just the psalmist, but together to celebrate and to thank God for that work. Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And I want to bring that and tie it back in. So what does that mean for us today? Well, alluding to Jesus, just as God miraculously answered the psalmist, Jesus today is God's answer for you in your distress. Jesus can miraculously answer you in the dark moments of your life to bring about a dramatic reversal of what's happening. Jesus, as it says in verse 5, he can set you free, just like he did for the psalmist. Now, what qualifies Jesus? Like, how is he able to be this for us. Well, I want to just share with you um, two things uh, that qualifies you. So why, uh, what qualifies Jesus to do so, to be able um, to answer us in our distress? Well, first, number one, is that he himself experienced distress. And so applying verse 22, right, um, the king's own rejection and distress is applied uh, to Jesus, right? And so we see this referenced in, um, in the Gospels, meaning that Jesus was also rejected, despised by the world. He suffered. And his distress was so great that he would later, um, at the end of the Passion Week, in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweat drops of blood. But what that means for us is that Jesus understands distress. He understands despair. He knows your suffering. He knows your distress because he too had felt it. Hebrews chapter 4, 15, 16 reminds us of that, that we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And the result of that, Jesus being able to empathize and relate to us, verse 16, let us then we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And Jesus himself experienced distress and he can then understand and answer you in your distress. But then not only that, second as well, that he has the power to set you free. Second Peter verse one, 
uh, chapter 1, verse 3, his divine power, Jesus, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And this morning, if the psalmist, if the king's experience is yours, if you are experiencing you know, distress, despair, hopelessness, I hope that you can find encouragement and comfort in knowing that God, through Jesus, answers your cries to him. That in Jesus, you can, as it says Hebrews 4, receive mercy, find grace to help you in your times of need, in your despair. In Jesus, you can experience victory over your distress. But the second thing this morning that I want to point to that Psalm 118 tells us about Jesus, number two, in Jesus, complete deliverance is offered to you. Now, for the psalmist, the reason for thanksgiving, again, is because he experienced God's deliverance personally and tangibly. And it's described in verse 5, that experience as being set free. Now, what would that really look like? Well, we can kind of uh, uh, get an idea from what else is said in Psalm 118. And so the results of being set, set free, if we skim Psalm 118, things like having no fear, verse 6. Having eventual triumph over your enemies, verse 7. Experiencing God as a place of refuge, verses 8 and 9. Or experiencing God as your helper, verse 13. And so when the psalmist writes in verse 14 that the Lord has become my salvation, it means that he has been saved out of his distress, out of his despair, and the result is being set free, meaning that his distress no longer had a hold on him. He was no longer boxed in, confined. And verse 25 and 26, the assembly of people then continue as they hear this testimony, they join in with the psalmist in, a, in acknowledging God's work in vindicating and restoring him. Verse 25, they lift up a prayer for salvation together. They say, save us, we pray, O Lord. And further, 26, uh, they further recognize that this restoration of the king was the Lord's doing because the king was coming in the name of the Lord. He has been blessed. It was the Lord who had done this. And of course, as we, you look at these two verses, 25, 26, these two verses are what's referenced on Palm Sunday as Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And so we'll, in Matthew's account, so you see uh, Psalm 118 at the top and Matthew 21, 9 uh, below it. So Matthew's account, and the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna is the English transliteration of the, what's written in Greek in the New Testament. Uh, Testament text. Um, and so uh, the, this is in fact a translation of the Hebrew phrase, save us, or save us we pray, that we see in Psalm 118, 25. And in Matthew's account, um, it's significant to note that the people say it twice, right? Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now, what did they mean? Well, this uh, reference to the son of David, it's the messianic title that stressed the kingly role that the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one would, pray, would, would play. Right? That he would come to rule the nations. And he who comes in the name of the Lord is likewise then also a reference to that Messiah who would come in the name of the Lord in order to save the people. However, the crowds that were there, and Pastor Chris referenced that uh, just before he, he prayed, as they watched and they celebrated and they shouted Hosanna, they in fact misunderstood what Jesus would do to bring deliverance. Because they expected to be delivered, yes, but um, uh, but a different kind of deliverance. Right? They wanted to be delivered from Roman occupation. They wanted to be delivered so that the nation of Israel could be reestablished to prominence 
among the nations of the world. What they wanted was in the here and now, the immediate, the blessing. Right? Yes, it was deliverance, but it was an incomplete deliverance and not what Jesus intended and not his purpose. And so Jesus, what he intended, he came to restore the sinner into a right relationship with God. Mark 2, 17, Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. See, the deliverance that Jesus came to offer wasn't just immediate or physical relief of bad circumstances. And that was what the crowd wanted from him, an earthly ruler. But what Jesus came to do, the deliverance he offered, was deeper, was more holistic. He came to deliver us ultimately from the sins that separate us from God. And in doing so, Jesus' deliverance would be complete. One of my favorite verses in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25 um, just reminds us of that, that uh, in the NIV, therefore Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. I actually really like the ESV translation that Jesus saves to the uttermost. But yet, this completeness is not all experienced and doesn't all happen right now in the here and now. And we can illustrate this if we look back to our passage, um, verse 26. Um, so we kind of get a sense of that, right? Uh, the usage in, in the gospel. So Jesus in Matthew 21, 9, uh, Palm Sunday, the crowds are, 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 are referencing, right? What, what's going on that, um, that he is, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But yet Jesus, later on in Matthew 23, uh, quotes this again. Right? That um, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so there's this, you know, this, this tension here. Like Jesus is here, he is present, he offers deliverance in the here and now. But yet there are aspects of it, things that are still yet to come upon his return. However, we have hope, right? We know that Jesus is victorious, and we are victorious with him for all those who believe in him. And while we wait, Jesus also encourages us. John 16, 33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. And Jesus himself acknowledges that in this world we will suffer, there will be despair, there will be distress. But he also says that he has overcome the world. And so what can we do? What can you do? Again, we look back at the text here, just like the psalmist. Cry out to him in your despair. Call out to him in your suffering. Because we see that he answers you. And that if, as you pray, as you cry out sincerely with all of your heart, that you too can experience an answer from him, deliverance for you. But finally, one more thing that Psalm 118 tells us about Jesus. Number three, in Jesus, you're invited to respond to God's goodness and steadfast love. Now, to this point, we have stated, right, Psalm 118 emphasizes both the distress that is experienced by the psalmist, but then also God's supernatural deliverance from the circumstances. But then there's also one other emphasis throughout Psalm 118 that we have to make a note of, in that, and it's that the psalm uh, emphasizes both the psalmist and the entire community's response to what God had done. And so for the psalmist in 118, he experiences God's goodness and steadfast love through being delivered out of his distress. And this deliverance experience is then interpreted by him as God's goodness and steadfast love. 
which then leads the psalmist to further respond to him. And this pattern, in fact, is a thematic pattern that we see um, within the entire psalm. And so um, we see this pattern of uh, being in distress, but then calling out, crying out to God, and then God answering those cries, and then praise and thanksgiving as a result of that deliverance, that answer. And in verse 27 and 28, we actually see two ways that the psalmist responds to, uh, to God, and the, the psalmist as well as the entire assembly. And so the first is this. It's a, we see a declaration of faith and trust. The Lord is God. And that, the, the, the word for, for God, El, is a proper name. It's a recognition by the people that the Lord is the highest and the only God. In that verse 27, he has made his light shine upon us. And you may recognize um, that imagery. Um, It echoes the blessing, the benediction that we sometimes use from Numbers chapter 6, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. It's an acknowledgement that God has heard their prayers. It's a recognition that he has shone his face upon the assembly and that as a result, uh, they're celebrating and praising him for his deliverance and blessing for the psalmist. And that declaration isn't just a, a factual declaration, but it's also a very personal declaration as well by the psalmist. You see verse 28, you are my God which he repeats, you are my God. There's a sense, we, I put ownership, but it's not, you know, you can't really own God, but there's like a personal connection there, right? That it's not just the God of the universe, but it is my God, a relationship, a closeness to that God. But secondly, we also see uh, they respond with praise and thanksgiving. Verse 28, I will give thanks to you, I will extol you. In the second half of the king's declaration um, that the one true God is his God is another resolve. So just like in verse 21, once they've declared the Lord is God, and then the psalmist that you are my God, the resolve comes to praise and thank him, to extol him, which means to exalt, to lift him high up. Now notice, again, right, I'll point this out to you again, that theme throughout Psalm 118, call out, uh, uh, distress, crying out, answer, which then leads to praise and thanksgiving. And I point that out again because it's an important takeaway for us that God's deliverance, and so again, experienced here um, in, uh, in the form of God's steadfast love and goodness, God's deliverance are tangible experiences. And some of you today will have these experiences of God answering you in your distress. But what I want to connect us to today is that with those experiences, as we, as we um, are in distress, as we cry out, as God answers us and delivers us, it must lead to a response from us. Namely, in praise and thanksgiving which is the message of Psalm 118. Crying out to God in our despair, God providing deliverance, and then not only the individual, but the community coming together to praise and thank him in response. So we see here in Psalm 118, it's a natural movement from lamenting in despair to rejoicing and praising as the result of these tangible experiences of God's deliverance. And in fact, what we see is that praise and thanksgiving in the Old Testament are never isolated um, in and of itself. And what I mean by that, so um, <clears throat> it's easy for us, you know, today, to, we come to church, um, and then during the worship time, we sing the songs, and we have our time to praise, uh, praise God and, and, and thank Him. Um, and, and, it's, and then that time, that time of praise and thanksgiving is kind of isolated among itself. But what we see in the Old Testament and in Psalm 118, that praise and worship never just happens on its own by itself. It is intimately connected with lament. 
that it comes as a result of that pattern that we're pointing out. And again, we've looked at lament in previous weeks, and what we see here today in Psalm 118, we can say is uh, praise and thanksgiving is the other side of lament, and the two go together. And so, kind of bring things to a close, I just want to share with you just one um, quote by Thomas Constable, which summarizes the psalm for us. He says, this psalm teaches us much about Messiah. But its primary significance, as the Israelites used it originally, was glorifying God for providing deliverance. This deliverance came after a period of evident defeat. God had reversed an apparent disaster and brought great joy and victory out of it. We should praise him as the writer called on his hearers to do whenever he does that for us. In your distress, in your cries for help, God responds. You will receive deliverance. But then we are called to respond to him. And so this morning, I want to just invite you, so if you have yet to receive Jesus, what that response may look like, perhaps it's the time for you to respond by seeking him more finding out more information, or perhaps you even respond to receiving him as the Lord of your life to begin that relationship, to begin to have these experiences of God and his deliverance in your life. But for those of you who have been Christians, believers, and maybe for a very long time, well, let me ask you this. How is your response to God's tangible goodness and steadfast love in your life? Do you take it for granted? Do you intentionally connect your distress, your lament, to your praise and thanksgiving for him as you experience him in deliverance? Draw this to a close as we bring it back here, that in Jesus, God provides victory over our despair. And that is what we come on Palm Sunday to celebrate, though the crowds in Jesus' day misunderstood what that meant, that our God saves, that today we know and we can celebrate that, that even in your despair, in your suffering, that you can cry out to God, that he answers you, and you find deliverance all through his son, Jesus Christ. So come back again, um, just this inclusio, verse 1 and verse 29. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Jesus is the ultimate and perfect expression of God's goodness and steadfast love to you. And so I challenge you, I invite you today, all of us here as the assembly of his people, to respond to him. As Psalm 118 makes clear, the response to God's goodness and steadfast love is to rejoice, to give thanks. So how will you respond to him today? Let's close off our time with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, because you are a God of goodness, a God of love, loving us with the love so dear that you would send your Son as the atonement for our sins. And so, Lord, as we enter into Holy Week on Palm Sunday, as we are here to celebrate and as we um, shout out to you our cries for help, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, God, would allow us to tangibly encounter you as you answer us. But, Lord, may we not leave it just as those experience, but may it drive us, motivate us, Lord, to seek you more, desire you more, to come before you, Lord, and to praise you and thank you for all you have done, for the deliverance, Lord, that you have shown us in our lives. We give you thanks once more, Lord, that through Jesus, complete deliverance is found. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think as we... um, respond to uh, what was just shared. Um, I invite you, again, if you're able to, to stand. 
we respond in praise and thanksgiving as we sing this song together, I stand amazed. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wondered how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean sing that again I stand amazed Stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And wondered how he could love me, sinner condemned. standing as we conclude with the singing of the doxology and afterwards we'll uh, end our service with the uh, with the benediction Cheers. 
final Sunday before Easter weekend, and so our last Lent uh, week six exercise and um, fitting as we talked about l a lament leading to praise and thanksgiving, that you're invited as you participate this week to write a lament um, for yourself, um, to reflect on that experience, and um, again, to respond in praise and thanksgiving as you experience God's deliverance for you. And so let us receive the benediction this morning as we close. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Aaron, for your message and for leading us through that response. Before we close off, we have a few announcements we'd like to share with you today. And so first of all, welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. The first announcement we have is, uh, well, if you have signed up for the newsletter already, you would have received it yesterday. But we can still sign you up. If you're interested in signing up for the newsletter, uh, I'm actually going to have a laptop in the back where you can sign up. Or if you just give me your email address and your name, I can sign you up for you. Uh, but we can get that sorted out. If you want to get the newsletter, you'll get the sermon notes and our latest news and updates. And so it's a wonderful way to stay connected with us. The other big announcement that we have is for this coming Friday. Uh, for Good Friday, we are going to be having a joint interchurch service at main campus. And so this is going to begin at 4 p.m. And we have a special guest speaker, Abdu Murray. If you are interested or you have people in mind that you've been praying about or God has brought to your attention to invite, feel free to take a flyer in the back and you can distribute them. We have a few more this week and so uh, you can take a bunch and you can, you know, put them on your neighbor's doors and stuff. But if you would like to join us, you will need to register. There is a limited amount of seating in the sanctuary. And so first we encourage you to sign up promptly, but also to arrive a bit earlier than four o'clock to try to claim a seat. Uh, those are all of our announcements for today. Thank you for joining us. Go in peace.